Georges Serrat exhibited this painting Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte in 1886 with the last Impressionist group exhibition. It announced the style that he had created, referred to as divisionism, sometimes as chromoluminarism, also known as pointillism. What all three names refer to is the way he used color and brushwork. It's impossible for a photograph to show us the experience of looking at Surratt's painting and discovering his style. That experience depends on being able to view the painting from a distance and then move in gradually, looking ever more closely at the evidence of his hand creating the painting. So here is a very extreme detail, a close-up photograph, which shows us why Seurat chose the name Divisionism. Each patch of color turns out to be constructed from vivid, tiny flecks of separate, contrasting color notes. It's mesmerizing to discover and get lost in the individual atoms of color. Up close, we see them as a field of individual color spots. From a distance, we see a vibrant field of glowing forms because those bright flecks resolve into an integrated image, like a pixelated di digital image resolving into a whole. We can see how Seurat was thinking about color strokes and color tones if we look at some of the sketches he made as preparatory studies for Sunday on La Grande Jatte, like this one. Here is the last complete study that Seurat created for his final canvas. And we can see the shimmering mosaic surface because at this point he was still using looser, bigger spots of color as he still intended this to be a final sketch, a kind of a painting of visual notes guiding what he would do with the final canvas. We could say that Seurat invented pixelation by studying 19th century color science. He did his paintings based on research from a book titled The Law of Simultaneous Contrast of Colors, which had been presented, published by a scientist named Michel Eugène Chevreul in the 1820s. Chevreul was analyzing how color works as an optical phenomenon, and it's totally magical and wonderful that his color wheel from his book here resembles an eye with a pupil, right? <laughs> because he wanted to understand how it is that we actually see colors in relationship to one another. And Chevreul's research is the basis for how we today analyze color in terms of the three dimensions of color. It's hue, the actual color hue, red, yellow, blue, violet, the intensity, it's brightness or dullness, as in the, the bright yellow, the dull, and it's value, how light or dark it is. And then of course, complementary colors work in oppositional, in oppositional energies. To appreciate what, what Chevreul was up to, it helps to look at the work of the modern artist Joseph Albers, who worked in the mid 20th century. And he, his artwork was really a kind of investigation. It was very rigorous, almost semi-scientific, where he was showing how a color looks brighter or deeper depending on its surrounding colors. So here in this painting, Alpers gives you these squares. These are actually the same color value, intensity, hue, but they look so different depending on whether it's placed on this orange versus this blue, complementary colors, interacting with this color hue. And then here you can see that the dark, he's doing the same thing. He's exploring how this dark blue seems more or less recessive depending on size, depending on its placement, and depending on, because that placement depends on how it is related to the purple and the other blues. The very same color looks 
different under different conditions. And so this is how we should understand what Surat is interested in, the optical dynamism of color interaction. Surat was doing something closely related to Impressionism, but significantly different. He uses Impressionist kinds of colors, bright, pure tones, but he applies them systematically using the science of color theory. And he's building these systematic compositions not by painting en plein air, but assembling them in the studio from many preparatory drawings. So this drawing shows us the figure that appears in La Grande Jatte, the woman standing on the riverbank fishing. And this is a very different way of approaching the process of painting than what Impressionists did. He's using meticulous analysis preparatory drawings. He's working in a systematic and conceptual way. He is not being spontaneous, and he's really not wanting to give us the sense of the fleeting observed experience. He's also, interestingly, working at a, on a very huge canvas, six feet tall by 10 feet. So he's moving away from those portable, modest size easel paintings that the Impressionist avant-garde had used. And this is giving us a sense a little bit of history painting again in an avant-garde context. There's definitely a sense of suspended time and a kind of gracious calm, which is very different than the Impressionist city experience. And so it's worth asking what Surratt is suggesting about Parisian social life as it was experienced on La Grande Jatte, this riverside spot for leisure, for picnics and gatherings, for taking in the sun, bring your parasol, your sun umbrella. At the exhibition, critics and the public reacted to the painting with disbelief and suspicion. One spoke of bedlam. <laughs> another said it was a scandal. And yet another called the painting a hilarity. <laughs> so in various ways, it touched a nerve in terms of seeing the kinds of Parisians who frequented this park facing the lower class industrial neighborhood. It made people touchy. And there were comments about what Surratt seemed to be saying about Parisians themselves. One critic spoke about the stiffness of these folk, their cut out forms. They remind us how we strike attitudes. Another said, also using the word stiffness, the stiffness of idling Parisians, at once starchy and flabby, where even recreation itself is a pose interesting comment. Perhaps he was thinking of this woman with her parasol and her pet monkey. It's definitely pretentious to go to the park with your pet monkey. Another spoke about the banal promenade of Parisians marching about like automatons. So there seemed to be something stiff, automaton-like, something that was not warm and not a real connection. So what was Surratt saying about the culture of fashion, posing, and spectacle? Was he caricaturing it, caricaturing it, mocking it? Surratt had strong anarchist politics, and he certainly was on the side of the realists in terms of the commitment to the working class and class consciousness. As an anarchist, he was a follower of Proudhon, who had ideas about working class emancipation happening separate from the state system. It's interesting that his style is about imagining a blending into unity of disparate elements, which could be understood as a kind of feeling for a society that might actually bring together various kinds of people. Here's another Surat scene of leisure, but what kind of leisure is this? These are working class people identifiable by their clothing. They're bathing at a spot which is downstream from the factories, the industrial zone that's spewing its smoke. We're not sure, so sure how pristine these waters are. And this fellow right here in the foreground, is he relaxing or is he just completely zonked out with fatigue from his work week at the factory? 
One very great art historian, art historian of this period, Linda Nochlin, spoke about paintings like this one and Grand Jatte being Surratt as an artist who inscribes the modern condition with its alienation, anomie, the experience of living in a society of the spectacle of making a living in the market economy. Certainly if we compare his vision of leisure to Renoir's, which seems all happy, chummy, warm, and fun, we can see that there is a quality of alienation, a quality of dehumanization that seems to be expressed even in the beauty of these flecks of color. 